Hey everybody, welcome back to World Club Short's last podcast of 2023. Uh, a lot has gone on this year. Um, some great events, some awesome uh, sports memories for all of us live from us and from the pros. Um, so we're going to dive into all this stuff, just kind of a recap of 2023 and and uh, what really stood out for us. And crazy enough, as, as much as the golf season is over for the most, for the most part and kind of starting to gear up to 2024 we had probably the biggest news drop of the year um this last couple of weeks so there was a lot of rumors about it but we're gonna we're gonna start off i think by talking about john rom and and, and really how that's going to affect live how it's going to affect the pga where does that go with the whole negotiation and who's next um so i mean well i'm gonna leave it up to you to kind of kick that one off because i'm not even really sure where to start i just think it's it's a really interesting pickle that uh, the PGA kind of finds himself in here, but um, you know, I, I don't. Who knows if it really affects anything at the end of the day if this merger happens? Yeah, I think that's where I'm landing. You know, all of this is happening in the shadow of the December 31st deadline for the PGA PIF deal to get done, and I think at this point, no one knows what that is going to end up looking like. Glenn, I think your perspective on this is interesting, which is basically, hey, merger's going to go through, go get your money now, and you know, then you'll be back on the PGA Tour in a year, or however long. But my question is, how much does John Rahm stand to gain? Because if it sounded like the terms that were rumored were he would get paid out this bonus through something like 2028 or 2029. Now, even a fifth or a sixth of that bonus is more than he would make in a PGA Tour season. So I get that, but it felt like we got to a point where the numbers we're talking about are just silly and made up because the whole financial structure of this entity or whatever the future entity is, is going to be so different in what? 12 or 18 months. So help me make sense of what's the motivation for a guy to go now to a tour that no one really thinks is going to end up existing in a little while. And there's all this chatter about this money that he's leaving for, but he's not really going to get all of it. Walk me through what you see as, you know, the motivation here. Well, I think you, you hit it there. It's go now, get the bag of cash. He's in all the majors for the next five years. He's in the masters for the rest of his life. He's in, U.S. Open, British PGA for the next five years. You don't have to worry about those. They can't take it away from him. He earned it. Um, so go take that bag. The interesting thing, and I think is going to come out soon, is this coalition of very, very wealthy people that Tiger Woods and a couple of the other power players for the PGA Tour put together. And rumor has that they've got, you know, what, $3 billion, $4 billion to go up against, um, up against the Saudis. And I think I think that's part of the reason why um, I think they got mad. I think I think Piff is saying, hey, we, we said we're going to merge. Um, now you guys are coming up with this bank of money and you're just going to do your own thing. Keep doing your own thing. And I think that's when they said, OK, so we got to we got to make some noise with these guys. We got to start, you know. I don't want to say taking hostages, but taking hostages, going and throwing a whole bunch of money at John Rom. You know, so it's like, all right, we're going to pick him off. You know what? Next, it could be Tony Finau. It could be Victor Hovland. It could be Terrell Hatton. It could be anybody when you throw that much money at them. So for Rom, it's it's a no-brainer. The, like we've said many times um, here on this podcast, in the next couple of years, the, the tours will merge. Um, there will be a settlement. They will be allowed to play out in each other's tours. There'll be some sort of agreement. So for him, it's just, let me just grab this money. Yeah, so you make reference to the strategic sports group, $3 billion-ish investment. Um, I think there are even some interesting takes on this. We don't know the size of the equity stake they're getting. Some people have said that their investment is likely contingent on the EIF merger going through and them coming to some sort of agreement. I I don't know what to make of all that, but um, Craig, I'll go to you next. Rom, aside from maybe Rory, had been one of the most vocal guys against Liv. He had said, 
my lifestyle wouldn't change from that amount of money. He had said, you know, that he was not supportive of the tour. He had said that he had pledged his loyalty to the PGA tour. Obviously, you know, at the end of the day, money talks, but I think you predicted when all of this was starting that basically this was going to happen. We were going to get a guy who said, no, no, I would never take that money. That's ridiculous. You know, did some moral grandstanding and then went away. How bad does this make John Rahm look in your eyes? See, I don't think it makes him look bad at all. At the end of the day, from when he said all that stuff in the very beginning, I get it. People, people pick their sides and they stayed loyal to the group that they were fundamentally with and they were getting paid by more than anything else they were getting paid by um but a lot has changed since then right like a lot of things were exposed uh, i think a lot of people started to lose some faith in the pga and how it was getting run and and not being involved in decisions that they thought they should be involved in whatever the case but i think i think the terms of all these deals have changed and i think it it's i think that at some point rom and some of these other folks looked at it as like man who, who am i being loyal to at the end of the day, it's either you're playing for – the only really big thing that PGA can say is you're playing for legacy if you're playing with us. If you're playing anywhere else, you're just playing for the money and you're you're kind of a headhunter. That was kind of their, always their rah-rah speech. But at the end of the day, I don't think you can really say that anymore because I just feel a lot of a lot of these guys feel slighted by the whole thing. They just – they were really pissed off. And I think there's some folks that are so heavily invested in the PGA – they won't leave. But I think a guy like Rom is like, this is, it, he even said it. He's like, this is, you know, a big portion of this is because of the money. I, I can't mm -hmm. sit here and tell you it's not, um, but it's, in a, it's a crazy amount of money. So we're, whatever it is, I don't know where it actually ended up. I don't think anyone really knows the number, but it's probably pretty damn good and, you know, life changing if he's going to make this move. But he also was one of the few guys that when the sides were split and, the, and one of the majors would come around, he didn't draw a line in the sand as far as like, I'm never going to talk to these guys there to him. They were always still his friends and they still were part of the golf world. And, you know, he, he never really was that vengeful, you know, blood in the eyes, ready to fight somebody. He was just, he understood it. He just, you know, just picked his sides. And I think his opinion changed when all this other information came out. So I yeah, think for me, good, sorry, if, I think, think you're on something there with the, the, and it's interesting to see the players, Throughout the ranks now, getting very, very vocal about how poorly Jay Monahan has handled this and the tours handled this. Um, you wouldn't have seen that before, and I think, I think Jay tried to win back the locker room, but now a couple months on, and I think now you're seeing Rory. The, you know, a lot of these players now think Rory and Cantlay and Tiger just have too big of a voice now. They're, you know, John Rahm was one of those guys. He, he was the best interview on Live ever. He was the most calm, steady. Um, measured, reasoned person to interview about Liv. He never put down the tour. He never put down Liv. Um, but he was a tour guy. And I think I think the fact that his voice wasn't being heard and Greg Norman, and he's, he's mentioned this, Rom has mentioned this in interviews, they mentioned a partnership. So Rom has been told he has a voice in Liv and what it looks like. And that's big. And, you know, once you feel slighted by this group, it makes it really easy to take a big bag of money and go over and play on this tour. And Glenn, I think what this really exposes for me, and I think it's a cold, hard truth that we all intuitively know, but nobody's really wanted to acknowledge is as long as you can get into the majors. And as you said, John Rom can, and he will be able to for as long as he needs those automatic exemptions before, you know, this situation is resolved. As long as you can get into the majors, nobody cares where they're playing regular season golf. I don't care how much you say you love the Genesis or the Byron Nelson or the Arnold Palmer or even the players or whatever the one at Torrey Pines is or Pebble or any of that. Nobody cares. Yeah. It, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is majors. Yeah. Like, I, I get that people love that Tiger has 80 however many, you know, PGA Tour wins and, you know, a lot of the guys who don't only play in the U S talk about their worldwide wins and that's great. But, uh, you know, when I was watching the PNC this weekend, I was a lot less concerned with Retief Goosen's 35 worldwide wins or whatever he has. And a lot more concerned with the fact that he's a multiple time major champion. Mm -hmm. And I think what, 
players are finally coming out and saying is that's really the only thing that matters. Um, and whether you win the live event at, you know, uh, wherever they play down here outside DC or in Florida or in Dubai or whichever one, or you win the Fortinet or that tournament in Puerto Rico that Tony Finau always wins. No one really cares what they're going to remember is four tournaments a year. And for guys who can get into those tournaments, the PGA tour doesn't really have anything to sweeten the deal to say, Hey, you should play your regular season golf with us. And I just, I, I retain all the qualms that I've always had about the live product. You know, we've talked about it a million times. The format sucks. The broadcast sucks, all of that. But there is nothing that the PGA tour can do to convince guys who can get into the majors that they ought to be playing on the PGA tour the rest of the year at this point. Craig, do you see it differently? Is there anything they can do? No, I I think, well, I mean, there is, they can change the way um, that's viewed as far as getting into the majors. So if you haven't won a major and you still got to qualify to get in, they can, they can always tweak that stuff and make it harder. It's already super hard, but they can make that harder, I guess. But, to me, the, the biggest thing about the ROM move, more than anything else, is there, there's a lot of alphas that went over to live. I get it. ROM is one of the first guys, I think, that, you know, if you're going to war, like he's one of the guys that he's just, he's he's a leader. He's cool. He's calm. He's collected. He understands the game. He looks at the big picture, whatever. I mean, even Rory, as soon as it was announced, it was like, there was no more, I'm never talking to this guy again. It's, oh, he'll be at Beth Page. Like, we're going to change the rules yeah. for the Ryder Cup to get you know, Ron back. Like he is a, he is the first difference maker. Even Cam Smith, who I absolutely love as a golfer, he's quiet, right? He barely does interviews. He's not like, he's not a rah-rah guy. Ron is one of the first guys I think going over that is going to tilt this thing in Liv's favor to some degree. I don't know what that means, rating sponsors or whatever, but it's, but I think people will, when he speaks, he's, you know, they're, when Ron speaks, people are going to listen. And I think that's going to be the difference maker. So I don't think the PGA will really, change too much but i think what they have to be careful of now is rom legitimizes live more than anybody else that's gone over so far so yeah. uh, i think one thing that needs to be noted is that i think golf professional golf these two tours specifically in professional golf overall has entered a danger zone where if you read any story in the comment section about any story whether it's live the pga tour the comment there's a common theme in the comments and it's i no longer care and like, yeah. it's, yes, I still care about the four majors. That's it. And I don't care. And now you've got the PGA tour losing big sponsors. Um, yep. like Wells Fargo dropping out. Um, the PGA tour is going to have to redo the, all their TV deals because they have promised so many players in the top 50 at each event. And I'm sorry, even though <laughs> world golf rankings is a bunch of bullshit because they don't bring in the live guys. So in the, in the, you know, networks are gonna be like, no way you, you gotta, you we didn't pay for this. We paid for a better product, but, but the, the, the scary part is that common theme of, I don't care. I love playing golf, love going out with my friends, playing golf, love playing tournament golf. I no longer care about watching golf on TV and that's bad for everybody. The players, the tours, the sponsors, the networks, it's bad for everybody. And, and they've really got to figure this out and they don't have a lot of time to figure it out. It has yeah. become a bunch of really rich guys that just seem to be complaining about golf which is is golf is supposed to be like the exit from it all. And how do I get away from all these other angst that I have in my life? Like I want to go out and play golf and then I want to watch these best, the best of the world go play and have a couple of beers and fall asleep on the couch. Well, now it's not even that. I mean, it's just, it's gotten more bad press in the last two years because of the, the grind between each other than anything else. So they got to figure that out. And I think things like rolling back the golf ball and like everything else is just like, man, Get out of your own way. Like mm-hmm. this is not the time. Yeah, would you focus on what matters for yeah. half a second? Yeah. And it's yeah. like, in, and if you're the average golfer, all you're thinking about is like, man, I just bought a $500 driver to get 15, 20 more yards. And now you're going to take that away from me with a new ball. Yeah. Oh, now you're going to, now the next thing is you're going to start to tailor the clubs back a little bit mm-hmm. and make it harder. Like uh, distance is what people crave in golf, especially the amateurs. Don't take that away. Like it's just, they can't, I feel like they just can't get out of their own way now. Like they're literally changing the game for 1% of it. It's, yep. it's silly. 
I don't think so stupid rolling back the ball. It, you're trying to protect, you know, a handful of classic courses like Marion that have no place to to go back and, and extend the course from ever being a major set again. It's still a hard course. I, I forget what won in, yeah. in 2013, but it wasn't it wasn't low. Um so but you're taking the fun out of the game for the well, the average golfer, which is 99.999% of the people who play, they like the ball where it is. They don't want the pit at any shorter. You're doing this just for the professional game, which makes zero sense. Yeah, that was that US Open was won at one over par. <laughs> and the course did not exceed 7,000 yards. Now it is par 70, but it did not exceed yeah. 7,000 yards on any of the days. Yeah. So it helps. Like, it's like read the room. I mean, like, more yeah. than else, it's like, guys, now you're going to announce this stuff too. You're losing sponsors. Yeah. You're losing players. There's so yeah. much controversy going on. Now you want to make the game less fun? Like, what? A, like, just get out yeah, of it. It's, way. it's right. worse than rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It's like you just hit an iceberg and now you're actively hacking away at the hull of the ship. Yeah. Like it's, it is meaningfully worse. It's two um, Titanics coming at each other and they're both accelerating. <laughs> there's actually, there's three bringing the exactly. PGA Tour, the RNA, the USGA, and they're all steaming toward each other. And they're, they're good. It's just like elevators crossing in the night again. It's elevators <laughs> in the night, I think. Yeah. So my question is, does this make women's golf and college golf more interesting, more competitive products? Because the bottom line for those two things is, the talent is concentrated and they're kind of insulated from all the BS. Like you can watch an LPGA tournament or you can watch, you know, the USAM when it's on or a college tournament when they're broadcast without hearing about, you know, Brooks Kepka said this and John Rahm's going here. And I heard Patrick Cantley won't wear a visor because he wants all this money and this and that. Like for people who just want to enjoy high quality golf, I'm wondering if like professional men's golf stops being the place to get it. And I think the concern obviously is that professional men's golf brings in a lot of the money that drives interest in uh, other golf products. But man, like I'm, I could see myself having a lot more fun watching stuff that's completely divorced from the PGA live USGA RNA crap show that we've been seeing recently. I don't know if the others are going to increase as much as the decrease in ratings for everything else besides the majors. I, I don't, yeah, like, I don't see myself like lining up now and saying, Oh, I want to watch more college or LPGA or, or, and that's not a shot at them. I just, I don't, I don't watch a lot of them now, but it wouldn't, it doesn't excite me to, to watch more um, than what I'm currently doing. I just, I think I'm, gonna, I'm probably end up just watching less golf to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, I don't know. I just feel like it's, um, they, they were a huge marketing, you know, uh, drowning pool right now. They got to figure out how to change their view. So I don't know if there's anything else I'm going to do. Like even with Lib and Ron, I'm probably not going to watch a ton more Lib until they start changing the way that they broadcast stuff and the format yeah. changes or whatever. I mean, I watch a little bit to see what Ron does and, it, you know, depending on what his team is, but like, I don't know. I just uh, I feel myself finding less less. Wait, Craig, be honest right now. Is there anything that could any teammate that Rom could have that would actually increase your interest in live? Or are you just throwing no, a bone to the. OK, yeah. <laughs> OK, John right. Daly, there you go. All right. He's already said he'll go like sign him up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how unappealing a product you yourself have to be to advertise your interest in live and not get them to offer you a single dollar i don't know i just yeah so it's interesting i don't i just don't feel like i feel like golf as a as a whole is just going to suffer from this until they can figure out yeah how to you know get out of their own way for a bit you know when it comes to golf viewership i think there's a danger that this malaise is going to turn into a virus and it's going to affect every all mm -hmm. golf competition viewing it spectating, going to it, uh, supporting the events. Um, what separates golf from every other sport is that golf viewers play golf. Viewing golf and watching competitive golf is secondary to their own game. Mm -hmm. You can't say that about any other sport, maybe other than tennis. Yeah, um, I was going to say, people, does it kind of end up like tennis? Yeah, people play. The most important thing is they want to get out and play. 
And then after the round, they want to sit, you know, in the grill room and watch, you know, the end of the round on Saturday and Sunday and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, but it's not, it's not the be all end all. And, and the fact that they're pushing people to not care even more now is like we said, they're in a danger zone. They got to figure it out. Brutal. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've covered the live topic, the big move of the the month in professional golf. We'll keep an eye on what happens with the merger as we approach the December 31st deadline uh, here coming up in under two weeks now. But look, the reason that we are gathered here this evening, of course, is to have our one club short year in review. Um, and... There's been a lot that's happened in the world of one club short in the world of golf in our own lives uh, this year. And I think it makes sense to run it down. So first category, and I hope you guys are ready for it because I am ineligible to participate um, geographically ineligible as it were this year. Uh, and Glenn, I'll go to you first best moment from a one club short event in 2023. Well, Selfishly, I'd have to say, say my 73 at Rock Remen, even though I missed a river of putts. Strong. Um, <laughs> but one of my favorite things is, uh, and Craig can speak to how this happened, the relationship with Backswing Golf, which I think is a really, really cool organization where we raise money for girls that are trying to make it in women's professional golf. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how much we made, but I think everybody was pretty psyched about um, trying to support that group out there on their beat the pro hole. Um, and I thought that was really cool. I thought, you know, the events are so great and everyone has a lot to say then, you know, how great of a time they have, but if we can give back, we can find ways to give back to people in the golf community. Um, that's huge. And let me be clear the, that I would not beat the pro. <laughs> well, every one of the, um, ladies that they sent were awesome in their own right, which is super cool. Like there were different personalities, different type of golfers and, you know, um, but every one of them was so engaging with everybody that, that they came across. And they just, and they were, they were awesome. I mean, like I, I, every shot that I saw these ladies hit were just, you know, everything was within like 10 feet of the, of the pin or closer. So it's, they were tough to beat, but they were just, they were fun to be around. They, they just, they uplifted the whole event, I think in, yeah. in a way that we couldn't have done by just grabbing a local pro here and there. Like it was, it was an awesome group to work with and we're psyched to have them back next year. Mm -hmm. isn't it funny when you're around truly great players like professional caliber players um you just see that divide where like there are so many people and we all know them who are like really really good amateur golfers or weekend golfers or country club golfers or whatever and you're like hey i kind of feel like that guy could go pro and then you see them side by side with a pro and it's like oh <laughs> there's the difference yeah, I always find myself amazed by that. No, they were they were awesome. Yeah. So we're, we're that was a lucky find on our part, and uh, we're psyched to work with them again next year. That's they're great, terrific. Uh, mine's a little bit different. I uh, same venue that Glenn was just talking about, Rock Rimmon. But to me, the the highlight of the year for me was uh, playing with the Bus Jack guys. Um, oh yeah, one just their personalities were great. Uh, meeting Joe, their manager seeing how they, you know, how they do their matches, how they tape themselves or how they film themselves, how they break it all down. And then to see it on YouTube, you know, a week later or two weeks later, whenever they posted it and, you know, get the attention that we got, it was, it was great to me, but it was just, they're good people. I mean, I, got, I was lucky enough to play with them the next day as well. So I spent a lot of time with them um, and they were just as great as they seem on camera. They were even better in person. So um to me that was that was a really cool moment for for me I, I get a kick out of you know watching them you know um post stuff year a uh, week in week out and to actually get to meet them and play with them and see how good they are as well like holy cow they just bomb the ball I mean, they make everything look so easy mm -hmm. um but they're that good in real life too so that that was my highlight uh for the year um as much as i love all our regular players and and the loyal folks that come in and out like that was a that was a special treat love that that brings us to best performance in a major championship this year and i'll lead off this category because i specifically want to steal glenn's answer yeah. um 
you know, look, we had a lot of great performances in majors this year from what Rom did at Augusta to a shocking victory by Wyndham Clark at LACC. All across the board, Brooks Kepka maybe validating live at the PGA Championship. But by far, the best performance from a major championship this year was when, Craig, you and I were recording the British Open preview episode and Glenn texted us, Brian Harmon is going to be raising the claret jug on Sunday afternoon. Glenn, I have no idea how you did that. I hope that you put some money down on it because what an unbelievable pick. Solid majors this year, great performances across the board, but none better than you nailing Brian Harmon as the champion golfer of the year. That one deserves a lot of praise. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It's one of those things where I've always liked him since I fought him at the uh, TPC Boston a few years ago at the FedEx Cup, and he was just cursing up a storm and kicking his back, <laughs> and, you know, and he was in the hunt on Sunday. And I was like, I like this guy. He's small, he's fiery, you know, like little guys can play. Um, but no, just watching how he was playing throughout the season and, uh, and he played in Scotland the week before and a couple of weeks leading up and I was like, this, this kid's about to do something, finally break through. And it was just, you know, it was all sports things to guess. Unfortunately, I was sitting there with a, a buddy of mine, Izzy, who, uh, and he has, you know, he gambles, he's got the apps and everything. And I said, like, Brian Harmon, um, on Wednesday, you know, I met him before he was getting on a plane to, to go home to Florida. He, I don't think he, he didn't put any money on him. I didn't, I should have just said, Hey, just put the money on him. Now I don't have an app, but I wish I had. As soon as Glenn gets a cell phone, he's going to master that thing. <laughs> what phone doesn't get the apps? <laughs> yelling, yelling at your landline doesn't work either. <laughs> Rotary. Unless you know who to call. Craig, <laughs> uh, we'll go to you. Best performance from a major championship this year. I don't know if it was the best performance, but I, for me, the most memorable uh, was Rom by far. I think just, mm -hmm. I don't know. Augusta for me is always such an easy get out of jail because it just stands out. I just, it's so, I don't know. It's, it, it's so special. Um, you know, every time somebody wins there, it feels like it's the biggest thing in the, in the golf world. Um, but uh, I just, I just like Rom a lot. And I think what seeing him win is just was such a cool, um, cool thing. And, and uh, him and uh, uh, Brooks going head to head at the end was a was a fun battle. Like he wasn't running away with this thing. Um, Brooks, you know, had him in his sights, and it was down to the wire. Like I, so, I that that was my favorite of the year. That also led to one of my favorite one club short moments of the year, which was our half hour long debate about whether it was important that everyone from live except Brooks played terribly on the weekend at Augusta. That was, that was a classic. Go back and listen to that one. Glenn, aside from what you've already been credited for, mm -hmm. uh, any major performances you'd like to highlight from the year? Well, I'll tell you the one that, I, cause you stole mine. Of course. Um, I did. I think there's an obvious one left on the board. I'll say that. Well, I'm going to go with one the major performance that happened that shouldn't have happened. And thank God it didn't decide the tournament or else that's all we'd be talking about. And as that's, that's the official that gave Rory the drop on uh, oh the 16 or 17 on Sunday at the U S open, allowing yeah. him to come out of the bunker and over where he had a flat lie. Thank God he didn't, he didn't win the tournament because that official had been crucified. Rory had been ripped at the time when he's getting ripped left and right, you know, with, with live. So, it's the moment that happened that didn't happen. There you go. Um, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't give an honorable mention to Michael Block. Um, yeah. He, wow. in spite of not winning uh, mm -hmm. at the PGA Championship, was potentially the biggest story of that week. So good for him. One of the great up and downs on 18. Incredible. Into the top and now one of the biggest YouTube golf stars. <laughs> yeah. Everywhere. He's bringing his kids. He's played it right. Yeah. He's, he's figuring this out. Mm-hmm. Good, good for him, man. Good yeah. for him. Uh, Glenn, we'll come back to you immediately on this one. Your, we have it down as best shot, but your best shot or your best golf moment personally of the year? Best shot. It was my, this is my first round of 2024. I was down in Florida. Winston Trails Golf Club in Boynton Beach. I believe it was the seventh hole or eighth hole. I had 149 into a breeze and slam dunked an eight iron. Didn't bounce, didn't do anything, just 
Tung, right into the cup. You know, blew out the back of the cup a little bit, but the ball was at the end for a two. It wasn't a one. Holy it was a two. Wow. But that was, okay. my, that, was, that was my shot of the year. It was early, and then I, I peaked then. Craig, can you beat that? Um, yes and no. Um, goes back to the guy that was just speaking. It wasn't my best <laughs> of the year, but it was the first time I was ever able to potentially not just close out Glenn, beat the crap out of Glenn. <laughs> I was up three with three to go. Uh, it was and, four. What was that? Was it four? It was four with four to go. Four to four with four <laughs> to go. And he told me on that tee box, um, I'm coming back and I'm going to, I'm going to tie this thing up. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I, no, I just got to tie. I just got to win one hole. I got to tie one hole. That's all I got to do. <laughs> I lost the next four holes. Um, oh, no. And uh, we went and had a couple drinks and then went back and, and played some overtime holes, which I was able to get lucky and pull out, but it was the worst collapse yeah. in golf history. Maybe in all of golf. <laughs> in <laughs> all, of enough, golf history. all of golf history. Appropriately enough, you uh, beat me on the fourth extra hole. Four up, four to play, tied, beat me on the fourth extra you hole. You should have been like eight drinks in at that point. We shouldn't have had to go back out. I think actually we were four drinks in. Yeah. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> it was the worst. The four, 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 four match. Fours across the board. <laughs> uh, and he played great. Like he was sinking putts from like 20 feet away. He was chipping, like almost, ch almost chipping in a couple of times. It was just, it was horrible to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's uh that's tough um i don't know i don't know how you come back from that one craig honestly but I quit for good, a while. good luck to you yeah <laughs> um i was actually in a, a similar situation uh the best golf moment that i was a party to this year uh, i was playing golf with some friends up at Tavistock Country Club in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Shout out to Tavistock Country Club in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Um, and we're in a tight match. And then on back-to-back -back holes, my friend who was not on my team uh, made two of the most ridiculous chips that I have ever seen someone make. Um, one, I think it was the 16th hole. He's on the back of the green in the rough. Pin is like middle to back and the green is sloped severely back to front. And he hits this beautiful little tiny flop shot that just dies onto the green, rolls down, goes in. I was like, all right, you know, God doesn't want me to win this match. Um, I didn't, I didn't play a ton of golf this year. I didn't have a ton of great shots myself, but witnessing back to back chip ins to put me away in a match. Like, look, it was a cool thing to be a part of. So I'll give him that. <laughs> That's impressive. Back to back. Yeah, it, yeah, was, it was ridiculous. Being, being on the other end of those is not the coolest thing in the world. It's, <laughs> it's not. It's not. It really isn't. Um, all right. Some predictions for 2024. What can you learn from 2023 and apply to next year? First, right now, if we consult Data Golf, which uh, I will argue are the only real professional golf rankings, they'll tell us that. Scotty Scheffler is the best player on the planet and feels like a reasonable statement. I would say, uh, has him as about a quarter ish of a stroke per round better than Victor Hovland. If we record our 2024 year in review on December 19th, 2024, Glenn, who will data golf tell us is the best player on the planet? It's probably, they're probably going to tell us it's Rory and it will be bullshit because, the, you know, unless the live, if the live guys, no, they include the live guys, they live. include the live guys. They've got them. That's why they're the they only legitimate them. rankings. John Ron will be number one. Okay. Hey, John, John Ron, Ron who's currently, three to currently four. sixth. He didn't win three to four times. Three to four times. Okay. In a major. He'll win a major too. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Craig, who's going to be the data golf world number one on December 19th, 2024? I think it's still going to be Scotty. To be, I, I think he's he's just always around the hoop, right? He's, if mm -hmm. he's not winning. He's top five. Like he's just, I'd love to say Hovland uh, and 
just because he's so on fire towards the end of the last year. But um, we've seen that before, and we've seen people flame out. Scotty's just always around, right? And it's mm-hmm. just, I think he's gonna, I think he's gonna have another year where he's, he may not even win a major, but he'll end up being number one in the world. Just if you tally up all his his other wins and his top five finishes, uh, boring. But I just think he, that's just him. Yeah, I mean, so you guys have picked Craig. You went with the number one guy, Glenn. You went with the number six guy. I'm also not going outside of that group. If you're looking at the data golf rankings right now, you know where I'm going with this. Obviously, I have to pick Colin Morikawa. <laughs> um, just the steadiest guy out there. As long as he's healthy, I have him having a great season. Um, I think, you know, one thing we'll have to keep an eye on is how data golf is adjusting for field quality and giving out credit with the, you know, the further moves from the PGA tour and live. But, um, I can't have Colin Morikawa that close to the top today and not just bet on him to have a good year. It felt like his game was rounding into form a little bit late in the season. Um, you know, solid performance in the hero won the Zozo, obviously a uh, couple months back um, played pretty well in the FedEx cup playoffs. Can't ignore that sixth place finish at the tour championship. Um, you know, it was a rough start to the season for him, but I just don't believe that can last. So give me, give me Colin Morikawa and I'm going to pick him in every major next year too, <laughs> as you know, uh, him and Tom Kim, of course, yeah. by the way, <laughs> we don't need to get into it, but what a crummy penalty for him to get. Um, was it two weeks ago? Uh, it's just yeah, two and a half weeks ago. That it, was that was tough. Uh, it was just um, they got it. You you can't talk to one official and get a okay, and then another official come out and say, yeah, no, that's that's absolutely wrong. You can't do that. It's just yeah. I mean, the fact that you can memorize something, but you can't <laughs> you can't have the chart. Like it's just yeah, the rules are just so strange uh, and it's got to be as you said like the the key there is there's got to be a source of truth like yeah. if you go to the person who's supposed to know and you get an answer that has to be the answer whether it's right or wrong at that point yeah. by by the letter it has to be yeah and if that um, official is like i don't really know take a pause go find yeah. out yeah you know, on the same page and then come back you can't you can't have this gray area when it comes to the rules and i just feel like there's too much of that in golf right now even the Rory's stuff of, of, yep. of, you know, Hey, does he get a drop? Where does he get to drop it? Like how, how much does this benefit a guy that, you know, technically had a really crummy life, but that's what they all have to deal with. Uh, just, I don't know. There's just too much of that going on right now. All right. Our second of three predictions. Uh, and Glenn, we'll start with you. A player who is outside the top 20 in the world. Um, I'm going by data golf. You can go by vibes, but I'll call you out. If you pick someone who's ranked too highly, who you have winning a major in 2024. Is Cameron young outside of the 20? I believe Cameron young is outside of the top 20. Yes. He is 34th. He's my call. He had such a great rookie season. Um, was it in a couple of majors, a little bit of a sophomore slump, but, uh, I think he, he comes back to form and, and he wins a major. And I'll give you an honorable mention of Sahith the Gala and Siwoo Kim. Love all of those. And let's not forget, Cam Young gave us, what was it, two top tens in majors uh, this past year. So yeah. no, yeah, not, not maybe the season we expected yeah. from him in total, yeah. but showed up when it mattered. Yeah, he's going to bounce back. Got a good feeling about that kid. Hits it a ton and 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 just uh, he's he's all golf. Good player, uh, Craig. Who do you got for us? So that was going to be my pick. So I'm going to pivot a little bit, and this is probably going to piss you off, Will, because I'm going to take Will Zaltoris. I, I, I. W- that's exactly who I was going to pick. I'm sure you knew that, but yeah. Oh well, well, Glenn wasn't such a pick hog, and then he picked <laughs> out five other players. So you can't pick anybody. He's no. Yeah, that was that was questionable <laughs> behavior. <laughs> well, Will stole my Brian Harmon moment. This is my biggest moment <laughs> setting career, and even though I didn't. No, bet. but Glenn, I had to. I had to say it so you wouldn't look self-aggrandizing by taking it. You're welcome. <laughs> and you still look self-aggrandizing. Exactly. <laughs> when I corrected Craig on he was three down or three up with three to play. Nope, you were four up with four to play. <laughs> 
I blacked out in one of the holes. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I think Will's going to come back healthy. I think he's going to he's going to have a fire in his eye, like he mm-hmm. always does. He's probably figured out. He's had plenty of time to work on his short game while he's healing. Like I think uh, he's going to he's going to pull one out this year. Mm-hmm. Want to see that? Yeah, that was. I really didn't think you were going to pick him. So mm-hmm. that was that was who I wanted to go with. I. You know, there are kind of some cheap answers that you can give here. Like, no one would be surprised if Brooks Kepka, who's getting penalized for not playing well on Live, or Dustin Johnson, who's getting penalized for not playing well on Live, or Patrick Reed, who's getting penalized for not playing well on Live. Nobody would be surprised if one of those guys pulled out a uh, a major win. So, even though I don't feel great about it, because his game has not been trending in the right direction. I'm going to take Hideki Matsuyama. Um, Didn't play great in the majors last year, but he had, um, you know, a top 20 at the masters, which I feel like is a tournament. He's always dangerous to win and a top 15 at the U or at the British open. He, for him is just the putters got to be, working you know if you can look at his strokes gain putting or even just his number of putts you can pretty much know what kind of week he has i feel like for a guy outside the top 20 i think he might even be outside the top 30 um yeah he's 39th he's a guy who i feel pretty pretty good about betting on yeah his putter could get hot one week you know such a pure ball striker one of the best approach players in the world when he's on drives the ball well enough to be competitive. Uh, just the kind of guy who, you know, even if he's not there every week, I feel like no one would be surprised by seeing mm-hmm. him at the top of the leaderboard in a major. Absolutely. Justin Thomas is out there too, right? Yeah, I thought about Justin that. Thomas I thought is 20th. So he's, he's still- I think if, if you're 20th, you're in the top 20. Yeah. That felt like cheating to take him because he just, you know, he had a bad slump, but he's not, he'll be back. Yeah. 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 I think he'll be, he would, he, He'd be disqualified as a pick if we did this by March, probably, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think he was in the world ranking. I think he was like 26. So Okay. Um, but. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's totally within the spirit of the question to pick JT. But yeah, he is 26th in OWGR right now. Um, last prediction. And Craig, I think this is going to be a particularly big one for you. Um, College football playoff is coming up here. Uh, Michigan has a chance to win its first unanimous national title since the Second World War. Um, It, of course, would still be tainted, as we know, um, because they couldn't stay out of trouble. But it would at least be, you know, not split with anyone except maybe Florida State if they beat Georgia in the Orange Bowl. So Michigan's really in a no-win situation here. But, Craig, I'll start with you. We got... Michigan playing Alabama. We got Texas playing Washington. We got the winners of those two games playing. How does the college football playoff play out? One, it is not tainted uh, <laughs> at all. I mean, hell, they played most of their season without their head coach this year. Crying out loud. Uh, yeah, Michigan, yeah for, who Michigan was so just, long. he just happened to be gone. He certainly hadn't done anything to get <laughs> suspended for those games. He was just away. I, still, he was I still haven't seen a lick of evidence. No one sent me anything. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I still thinking, haven't seen a lick of evidence is a little bit, it sounds a little bit like I haven't looked at the evidence. Um, say, say what you will. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, <laughs> Michigan's going to walk away with this thing. Really? Yeah. I think their toughest match is going to be their first game. Um, I think Washington's going to be Texas and Michigan's oh. going to beat Washington in the uh, championship. Okay. That is interesting glenn Craig's not going to want to hear this but no one wants to play alabama right now they're on a mission yep. um i think they it's said it's about a million dollars that michigan beats alabama that so mm-hmm. not everybody glenn yeah. is, <laughs> i think he also put a hundred thousand yeah. dollars on sam hartman winning the heisman the week yeah. before ohio state yeah, he's, he's so, i don't know that he's years. where you want to be getting. he actually just went through some of his gambling losses this year it wasn't pretty so yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if he actually did do the bet but he was boasting about it but i, I think the alabama michigan game is the national championship i think alabama squeaks it out and then i think they blow out washington in the in the championship game that's my prediction yeah so 
Glenn, I'm with you that Alabama is going to end up being the national champion, being the national champion, but uh, they're, they're going to be beating Texas. Um, look, the, the bottom line and Craig, we, we got into this a little bit on a prior episode, but I want to, I want to clarify it. The bottom line is the only thing that matters in college football is roster talent. And Alabama has the most talented roster in college football. And when you have a matchup of the most talented roster in college football against the 14th most talented roster in college football, which is what Michigan has per the 24 seven talent composite, you know, who's going to win. And the gap between Alabama and Michigan is the same size as the gap between Michigan and Texas tech. So that's why a team like TCU last year who had a Heisman finalist at quarterback and Michigan had everything go wrong. That's why TCU was able to win that game. That doesn't happen if Michigan is the most talented team in the country. And that's why Michigan's not going to be at Alabama by the same token. It's six versus 26 in the Texas Washington game. I'm open to the idea that transfers aren't being accounted for as accurately as they should, but I just don't buy that uh, Washington has the defense to be able to contain the skill players that Texas has. So yeah, give me Alabama over Texas in the national championship game and we can go into the dark age that will be the 12 team playoff era. I little, hate to break it to you, Craig. Did your little what database break down that Auburn literally was fourth and 31 away from beating your mighty Alabama? And then what happened? Yeah, they had a Hail Mary once in a lifetime lucky play. So you play the whole game, right? It never have happened. You, you play happen. the whole game, not the whole game minus one play? It's, it's got nothing to do with the whole game. Auburn should never have been in that game compared to your with your little database. But then who won? Good and who's not? It's just that's like what I'm saying you got to play the game. And when you sure, try to but, you so, bring it. Because Craig, is this what you said? Play. Is is this what you said about like the Georgia Missouri game in 2022? You were like, oh no, TCU might win because Georgia played with their food against Missouri. And then what happened? Come on. I never said Georgia was by far the most dominant team in football all season. They 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 almost lost to Missouri. I don't know what you're talking about. Like <laughs> Day in and day out, Alabama, you can't say that about Alabama this year. They were not. They had. They've been on a great run, but they almost blew it against one of their biggest rivals in the biggest moment. Took fourth and thirty-one in a in a game that should have been over. So all I'm just saying is, take your little database and shove it up your butt because it doesn't mean squat when you get on the field. Uh, you know when it didn't mean squat, and that's a great point, Craig, is when Michigan gave up like a million points to a team that went on to lose sixty-five to seven. Um, that's another time that it didn't mean squat. Uh, anyway, keep living in the past, bro. <laughs> I look, there's definitely, definitely someone's living in the past here. Someone's dismissing the facts here on various things. Um, Craig, we're going to throw in an extra prediction for you. Labor yes. day weekend, 2024, the head coach of Michigan football is who? That's a great question. Um, I don't, I still don't know if any pro team is dying for Harbaugh. So I, I don't know if, I don't know if he's going anywhere. They made him a great offer. He hasn't accepted it. So I think he's thinking he can go somewhere in the pros, but I don't know. I just don't know with all the drama that's around him right now. Is a rebuilding team in the NFL going to want him? If he, if he, I, I think he's either going to go to the NFL or he's staying in Michigan. I don't think he goes to another college. No, no, definitely not. I think so, it would it would kind of have to be the Pete Carroll situation, right? Where, yeah. you know, he kind of did everything he could at FC and he left when he had brought them into a questionable place and, you know, they needed to rehabilitate their reputation and, you know, it was a good fit in Seattle. But I agree. I There are some reporters that I've listened to who seem very convinced that Harbaugh is gone and that Sharon Moore is going to be the coach of that team. And I'm not sure either of those would be the case. Like I, as you said, not clear to me that Harbaugh, that there's real NFL interest in Harbaugh. And then on top of that, Sharon Moore has done a great job when he's been in the interim role, but it's not clear to me that that's where Michigan would go. So that'll be an interesting one to watch. 
Yeah, it's tough because he he's coached great in the games that he had with Michigan this year, but uh, you know, I don't know what he's like in the locker room. I don't know what his demeanor's like for a whole season. I don't know what his recruiting's like. You know, they may have to go with a bigger name just to start. I, I don't know. I don't know where the head's at with that. I just know if I'm an NFL team and I'm building and I'm bottom of the barrel building something back up, you don't take somebody that's coming in with a ton of baggage and a ton of bad press and everything else. You're like, who's the the cleanest, the most structured person that can take this team to the promised land? Um, I, I don't know. I just don't think you – but then again – there's a lot of coaches out there that just keep getting recycled, and you're just like, oh, these guys aren't that good anymore. Like they <laughs> lost the game. Why, how do they continue to have jobs? So, what the hell do I know? Um, but I, I think he's at Michigan next year, if, if you're asking me. Okay. So, Glenn, I was about to pronounce the Bills dead, um, <laughs> and they kept it. giving me reasons mm -hmm. to think so. Lost to the Patriots, lost to the Bengals, lost to the Broncos, lost to the Eagles. It was what four losses in six games and five losses in eight games or something. If you go back to the, the All Jags one score game, losses. All one score losses, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then they come out, they go to Kansas City and they win, and then they host the Cowboys and beat the crap out of them. I think we have to ask. Have the Bills turned the corner? Are we seeing them play to their full potential? Not only have they turned the corner, <laughs> they're the best team in the NFL, and they haven't hit their potential yet. Oh. Listen to me here. The next two weeks, Bills play the Chargers and the Patriots. They're going to mm -hmm. win both of those. Miami plays Dallas and Baltimore. They're going to lose at least one of those which means mm -hmm. Buffalo, Miami, week 17. There's a reason why that game isn't scheduled yet and hasn't been all year. That game is for the AFC East. And not only does Buffalo go into Miami, beat them, win the AFC East, they go on to win the Super Bowl. That's my first prediction of 2024. After Cameron Young winning a major. Uh, uh, okay. All mm -hmm. right. I, I will I'm take your this. word for it, I guess. Again, I got to put a bet on the Bills to win the Super Bowl. I meant to do it a couple weeks ago when everyone was doubting them. I said, they're going to come back. They're going to get in the playoffs, get in the tournament, and anything can happen. That beating they just put down on Dallas was super impressive. Yeah, that they're was really impressive. They're, they're 100% back. They look healthy. They look they look like they're confident. They Josh Allen was like, yeah, you want you want me to hand the ball off 50 times today? No problem. I'm, I'm gonna get a running game. game. If you would have told me Josh Allen's going to go, what was it, 7 for 14, 95 yards, did Buffalo win that game? I'd be like, no, of course they didn't. Dominated the game. Yeah, didn't matter. And, and, and then he's on good defense on Dallas, and they just beat the piss out of. Um, yeah, so it's just I'm, I'm high on my bills. Craig, we'll wrap it up with this one from you. Uh, the Giants, for a period of time, found lightning in a bottle with Tommy DeVito, who I first saw play football in person at. Yankee Stadium in 2018 against the University of Notre Dame when he came in as an injury replacement for Syracuse and lost 36 to three. He has since then won a number of NFL games. Um, people are saying he ruined the tank. The Giants by point differential are the worst team in the NFL, but they have kind of backed into these five wins what do you what do you make of this? Is this a try to go eight and nine and salvage what you can salvage, you know, moral victories situation? Or is this, you know, man, we really screwed ourselves over for draft position by winning these games. I wish things would have gone worse. What do you make of the the Tommy DeVito renaissance for the New York Giants? Tommy doesn't feel like Anthony Lynn of, you know, <laughs> or that 10 years ago, whenever he yeah. made his Knicks debut. Um that's Jeremy Lin. Anthony Jeremy, Lin sorry. was the coach of the Chargers, I think. Sorry, I was close. Jeremy Lin, sorry. <laughs> Insanity. Um, but I think um, – no, I think it's fine. Like, you can't lose the locker room and go two wins for the whole season. You just can't. I mean, like, mm -hmm. at, at that point, they're looking at new GMs, looking at new coaches again. Like, Giants have been there, done that. Like, I get it. We're still, we're still in the top five for draft picks. So, like, you know – if if you if the top two guys are there and, and you want Daniels, he should still be hanging around. But if you want to get one of the top two wide receivers, they're going to be there. 
another tackle because obviously our line sucks. I think DeVito's been sacked 35 times in the last five games, which is it's like impossible insane. to do. And it's like it's just it's embarrassing. So you gotta there's a lot of things the Giants need to do. Um you're gonna have Daniel Jones next year anyway. They're not gonna cut him. Um and and I think if you look at the how many starting NFL quarterbacks are out right now and guys like Browning, DeVito, you know, whoever, they are all like there's this renaissance of new backup quarterbacks that are playing great if they just get the shot and they put in the right system and the coaches adapt to what their skill sets are. You can manage a good football team and and still put up some great wins and numbers. Giants need so much help, so you can't you can't tank the season. Um, it's just it's just not the right thing to do. These wins have been great and fun, but it, I mean, I I was at the Giants Patriots game. It was literally the worst football I had seen in a long, long time. I, I just I couldn't wait to leave. To be honest with you, it was just punt, 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 and then it started to rain. It was finally my trigger to say get the family out of there because it was so painful to watch. Um, so. I don't know. I'm, I'm psyched he's playing well. Seems like a great dude. Love his agent. Um, and uh, I think uh, I think it's exactly what the Giants needed, a little kick in the butt to to get the fans back motivated again. But nothing's changed. They're not a good football team right now. They, um, yeah. They've got a lot of work to do. They need a lot of positions. So I don't even know that they would go quarterback next year if, unless, like, the top – unless they were number one. And that was never going to happen anyway. They're not – you know, they're never going to get that. By the way – the the picture of the Panthers Falcons game, I don't even know if you saw that. It's like oh my gosh, minutes, fifteen minutes before the game started, and there was like eighteen people in the stadium. Yeah, and it looks like it was a picture from twenty twenty, mm-hmm. and the tickets were being yeah. sold for under a dollar, forty five cents, forty five cents, <laughs> and that is insane. That's a, mm-hmm. it's a professional football team, two professional football teams. Mm-hmm. It's just it's crazy to me. So when we. Panthers are going to get the uh, the number one pick, which is going to go over to the Bears. That's a done deal. We're going to get somewhere in the top five or six. That's fine. Um, and then we get two first rounders next year. I mean, I mean, the, in round two. So if you really want to make a move, get rid of those two in the second round and grab your quarterback. But I don't think that's going to happen either. I think they just need so many players. You take what you get, you know. But you can't you can't tank the season. Just can't. I kind of wish the Patriots would have tanked the season. Mac Jones isn't the answer. Bailey Zappi clearly isn't the answer. They have that giant game. I guarantee they sure did. That, that game, 20 yards. I know it was, it was just yep. dribbling rain. Like, you don't miss that. I could kick that field goal, and I suck. Yeah. Like, that's that was a, hey, we don't need to make this. <laughs> like, like, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Um, so with that, that wraps up our 2023 year in review on the One Club Short podcast. Uh, Glenn. Any parting shots from you before we wrap things up here? Uh, anything maybe on the Rutgers Scarlet Knights men's basketball team or anything else you feel like commenting on? Uh, you know, hey, congratulations to Rutgers. I don't believe anyone was arrested on the football team. <laughs> and we're they made it. The, playing the U at the uh, pinstripe ball. Will you be in attendance? No. What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't even know that. <laughs> no. I think it was like the, the Little Caesars pizza giveaway night. Like they had like in their third game of the year. But you know, okay. there's any giveaways. <laughs> I'll watch on TV. I've got uh, I've got January 28th circled on my yeah. calendar. The Purdue that's Boilermakers it. coming to the rack. Uh, that's oh, look, we go. can. I, I lo- love me some Purdue Scarlet Knights football. Against, Purdue has yep. trouble against uh, Rutgers and basketball. Sure do. Love me some Scarlet Knights football, but really it's all about what the boys are doing down at the rack. Rack. Uh, Greg, wrap us up here. Where should people be looking for us? What should they be keeping an eye out for? Any any hints you want to drop about 2024? Floor's yours. So we want to first thank everybody for uh, coming to our events this year. It's been a, we, had some, we had a great showing at everyone. We've met some awesome people. Want to thank our sponsors for... Uh, all the, the help this year getting through um, uh, all our events. They, without their sponsors, we we would never be able to survive. So uh, thank you to everyone there. Um, next year, we're probably going to do two different kind of formats. We're going to do we're going to hit the road a little bit. If if the plan falls into place, we're looking to hit the road a little bit and um, do a different type of event. Um, 
so we'll give you more information on that in January, February, once that locks in. And then we're going to still do continue to do our normal one club short events, um, you know, up here in the Northeast. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot more to come. I can't really say too much because things are still in the works and I don't want to give away or, or give any bad information out. But just uh, hold on tight. One club short is going to take a little bit of a different direction next year. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and people are really going to like what we're doing and how we're doing it. So um, buckle up. But thanks again, everybody, for a great season. Uh, we're really looking forward to 2024. And uh, go blue. Well, uh, as people know, they can keep up with everything One Club Short's doing at OneClubShort.com or at One Club Short, where we are on Instagram. Um, we're also at One Club Short and then the number one on Twitter. Um, certainly, we'll be taking some shots at Craig if the uh, Michigan-Alabama game goes the way I expect it to on there. So tune in if you're interested in that. We are podcast is available wherever you get your podcast. You can get it with video if you're listening on Spotify. And you can also see the whole video podcast on YouTube where we are one club short pod. That does it for us and for the 2023 season. We will see you all again in the new year. Thanks everyone for listening. Bye.